Great. Well, thank you so much for uh, coming today. And um, yeah, I'm thankful to have the opportunity to open God's Word uh, with you today. And uh, we're continuing our study in the Gospel of John. We're in chapter 9 today. We're going to be looking at uh, verses 8 uh, through the end of the chapter down through 41. It's a lot of verses um, to cover today. So I'm going to do my best, especially with communion, uh, uh, to, to just make our way through this. And uh, it's kind of tough to, to really uh, break this up because we see this account uh, with the blind man. And uh, yeah, we just want to make our way through this and um, look at some, some key things. And last week we kind of began to move into this. We, heard, we saw this miracle happen with the blind man. And uh, Franz, he really brought out two things that were kind of in the background, but they're, they're really two strongholds that we see with unbelief. And uh, we had this Jewish mindset uh, that we saw. And Jesus, he addresses it at, right at the beginning. Uh, this idea that, uh, you know, who is it? This man, uh, or the, the disciples say, is it this man that sinned or uh, his parents that have sinned? And uh, really what we see is this misconception of syllogism. And uh, some of you might say, well, what is syllogism? You know, that's, that's actually, I had to look it up, I'll be honest. I, you know, uh, it's one of those things that, uh, you know, we probably learned a long time ago and we've forgotten. But a syllogism is a form of reasoning in which a conclusion is drawn from two given or assumed propositions. Okay? Or, yeah, propositions. So we have this idea that uh, from two things that should be true, they equal something that's true, is the idea. So, so really kind of the idea here is we see in this Jewish mindset is the idea that God rewards good people. That's one proposition. So if I am good, then I deserve to be blessed. That's the idea. And on the other hand, if uh, God punishes bad people and he is bad, we're not going to say ourselves are bad, he is bad, then he deserves consequences. He deserves to be punished. So that's kind of the idea that, they're, that we're working off here, that Jesus is, is speaking into with this miracle. So we kind of saw that last week at the beginning of uh, this passage. And the other thing that uh, Franz brought out was this idea of seeing with physical eyes instead of seeing with spiritual eyes. And we see this theme all through John. This is really one of the threads that runs through John, this idea of whether we're seeing with with physical things, we're seeing physical things, or whether we're seeing spiritual things. So we're going to look at these things as we're moving through uh, this passage today. And really what I believe Christ is doing here, he's tearing down these strongholds of unbelief. And we see this as we move into the, our passage for today. We see this like verbal sparring that's going back and forth, and it's on this topic of belief. And uh, we uh, start our in John chapter 9, verse 8, with the passage. And before we get into this, I just want to pray um, for our time. So, Lord, we just uh, commit this time to you. Uh, we want this to be central um, to our time meeting together. And, Lord, I pray that uh, your spirit would move um, among us to illumine our eyes to what is true today um, as we look at your word. Uh, so we pray um, that you would guide us into truth. In your name we pray, Jesus. Amen. So, yeah, we have verse 8, and it really starts this passage off, and uh, we have these neighbors. It says in verse 8, Therefore the neighbors and those who had previously, previously had seen that he was blind, they said, Is not this he who sat and begged? And then verse 9 says, Some said, This is he. And others said, He is like him. And then we see the response of this man. He said, I am he. So right off the bat, we see this confusion with what's happened, this miracle that's happened. We see this physical transformation of this blind man. And it's, it's um, so drastic that the people, these neighbors, these people that had seen this blind man, you know, day in and day out begging, they were confused. They didn't know what had happened. They're so confused that they didn't even know if this was actually him. And have you ever um, maybe been in a place where, you saw a physical transformation in someone that you didn't even recognize them anymore. Now, many of you might have known Franz from two years ago. 
<laughs> Sorry, Franz, I had, to, I had to go there today. But you might have seen Franz two years ago. And you see a picture of Franz from two years ago, and he was a big dude. He was a big guy. And uh, you might see a picture of him today or look at him today, and that might cause you to think, oh, man, is that, is that the same guy? You know, he's lost so much weight. I don't, I don't know if, if that's actually the same guy. And it might take Franz's presence to say, no, this is me. This is who I am, right? And this is kind of what's going on here. The, the man says, no, it's, it's me. This is, this is the one that you knew before. And he confirms his, his identity. And what's always the second thing that happens in this case, right? It results in a question. Well, how? How did this happen? How did you lose all this weight? In this case, how did you gain your sight? So verse 10 says this. This is the question they asked. Therefore, they said to him, how were your eyes opened? And then we see this, um, this answer that he gives. And I want to spend a little time here on verse 11 because I think it really is so important to the narrative that we see in John, what John is trying to say. But he gives this answer to his physical transformation. He says, he answered and said, a man called Jesus made clay and anointed my eyes and said to me, go to the pool of Siloam and wash. So I went and washed and I received sight. So this is what's happened. This is what has transpired to bring him into this new place of physical transformation. And notice just three things uh, from, from verse 11. Notice Christ's ability to create from dust. And I love the, the picture that we see here. You know, and, and I don't know what was in uh, Jesus' mind at this point. But what if he was remembering back to a, a really special memory for him when he created mankind? He scooped down and picked up the dust and made this clay and then placed it on this blind man's eyes and really formed two new eyes because this blind man was blind from, from birth. This, is, this was not just something that he had lost his vision. He was incapable physically of seeing. So in this situation, what Christ is doing is creating from dust. He's creating from the ground. So we see this element you know, it reminds us of Genesis 2, 7, where the Lord God formed man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living being. It's a mirror of that as we look back to creation. And then as we go on, we see that uh, Jesus commanded him to do this, to go to the pool of Siloam and wash. So we see this command. And, and notice the presence of water. And we see this this, uh, how John really uses water that, and Christ is this picture of living water throughout John. And we've seen it, you know, before in uh, uh, the woman at the well, where he says, I'm living water. And then a couple chapters later in, uh, in John 7, Christ says this, If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. But listen to verse 39. It says, But this he spoke concerning the Spirit, whom those believing in him would receive. For the Holy Spirit was not yet given, because Jesus was not yet glorified. So we see this, this presence of water. And in a way, maybe it's him pointing to what's coming. It's, he's pointing to what he's about to do. And uh, the, the Pool of Siloam is really interesting. If you, uh, if you really look more into what that is. But the Pool of Siloam was actually the lowest point in the historical city of Jerusalem that you could come to. And uh, the uh, Talmud said that the Pool of Siloam was the starting point for pilgrims who would make their annual pilgrimage to Jerusalem and where they ascended by foot to the inner court of the Temple Mount to bring an offering to the temple. So this pool of Siloam was um, used by pilgrims for ritual purification before they would ascend to the temple mount. So it's interesting to me that Christ told him to go to the lowest point and wash to be cleansed and to, and to receive his sight, to receive that healing. And to me, it, it's, it's a, maybe a, a picture of what's coming um, with how the Holy Spirit would come on people, how they would be baptized into the Holy Spirit as well. So, um, you know, we see this presence of water. And then finally, notice in, uh, in verse uh, 11, there at the end, he says, I receive sight. 
And what we see here is Christ's ability to bring light. And it's really a picture of his deity, a picture of who he really is. And, you know, it's a fulfillment of prophecy. When we looked at Isaiah 35, 5, and 6, you know, we talked about this last week um, where Jesus came and he said, Then the eyes of the blind shall be opened, the ears of the deaf unstopped. Then shall the lame man leap like a deer and the tongue of the mute sing for joy. Christ had come to be the fulfillment of this, to bring healing to the nations. And we look back to the beginning of John. Remember, don't forget what John said. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in in the beginning with God. All things were made through Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. And in Him was life, and the life of light was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. And and then don't even forget, right at the beginning of chapter 9, what Jesus says, he makes this statement, as long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. So we see these elements um, that John is bringing forth, these threads of creation, of how these elements of life, water and light, are found flowing from the Son of Man. We don't want to miss this today. Because it's really important to what John is trying to tell us through his gospel. Um, All of these things. So we see this, and this is his testimony. This is what he says has happened to me, to these neighbors. And then, you know, we we see the neighbors, and um, they said to him, well, where is he? It's like they didn't take his word, like that he he had been, you know, uh, healed, that uh, he had gained his sight. They weren't just going to believe, uh, you know, the one that the miracle had happened to. So they said, where is he? And uh, he said, I do not know. So at this point, they, they don't know what to do. They're, they're confused. Um, so what do they do? They brought him, and look how it says, him who formerly was blind to the Pharisees. And I, lo- I love this statement, him who formerly was, was blind. And for those of you who think that Prince was maybe the original you know, person that said, I'm you know, the artist that was formerly Prince, okay, he was just actually taking this from, some, from another source here, that uh, this was the, the man who was formerly blind. And they brought him to the Pharisees. And uh, we see you know, in verse 14 the key issue that is developing. You know, what is at the heart of this? What is so hard to understand about what's happened to this man? And it's right there at the beginning of of verse 14. Now it was a Sabbath when Jesus made the clay and opened his eyes. Now we're getting to the heart of of the problem. Because, you know, for the the leaders, the, the Pharisees, and the people knew this as well, this was an issue if someone healed on the Sabbath because he wasn't keeping the Sabbath. So we have to do something with this, because is that true? Did, did Christ really break the law when he did this? Did he really break the law, or did he break, did he break the Pharisees' interpretation of the law? That's right, that's right. They had believed something that was not true, and they had formed this whole ceremonial law around this idea of keeping the Sabbath. And, and I, I, you know, when I was studying this, even reaching down and kneading the, the dust into clay would have been considered work for, for the Pharisees. So they had this, uh, this idea that he was a lawbreaker, that he was a sinner. And how could he do this, this amazing thing if he was a sinner? So this is what the, the, the whole debate was about. This is where the division starts to develop. And this debate ensues um, as we move forward into the text. And and really, it focuses around their interpretation of the law and that that was being challenged, that their authority was being challenged. And I think one thing that we have to understand is that when we're confronted with the living Christ, it's going to cause one of two reactions. It's going to cause us to either believe, to recognize, or it's going to cause us to not believe and to reject. And this is what we see happening here, you know, as we move forward. And uh, it says that, uh, therefore, some of the Pharisees in verse 16 said, this man is not from God because he does not keep the Sabbath. Others said, how can this man be a sinner? So how can a man who is a sinner do such signs? And there was this division 
among them. So, it says, so moving into verse 17, it says that they said to the blind man again, what do you say about him? Because he opened your eyes. So we see now not only the neighbors who were struggling to believe, but the Pharisees and this division developing and their unbelief. And this causes uh, them to ask the, this question again, um, which leads to his statement. And I think the statement's really important because uh, the last time I think I spoke was uh, the Samaritan woman at the well. And uh, it, it's really interesting to see the mirror between um, this Samaritan woman's eyes being opened from seeing physical things to spiritual things, and maybe the, the same parallel we see with this blind man. Because look at his answer. He said, well, he's a prophet. And, you know, we see in John four nineteen, the woman said to him, sir, I perceive that you're a prophet. So both of them, they, they had this, this picture of Jesus as a prophet, and it came from this response to his supernatural nature. You know, the woman, it, Jesus had just told her everything that she ever knew. And she's like, whoa, what's going on here? I perceive this, there's something special about this guy. He must be a prophet. Same thing here. The, the, the blind man, he doesn't really know who Jesus is. He hasn't really encountered, you know, uh, his identity yet. So he says, well, he must be a prophet. And verse 18 says, but the Jews did not believe him concerning him, that he had been blind and received his sight until they called the parents who had received, uh, of, of him who had received his sight. So they weren't convinced by his answer once again, you know, even though he stated it um, and told them what, what, uh, what, he, uh, what had happened to him. They still doubted. So they call his parents. And it's really interesting to see the parents' um, response here. And, um, you know, I think it's uh, really uh, an indication of uh, where his parents were in many ways, you know, because uh, they were seeing this situation with physical eyes. They, uh, they were worried about uh, what was going to happen um, if uh, they admitted, you know, who Jesus really was. And you see what the parents say here. We know that this is our son. So they confirm his identity, that this is who he is, that he's been physically transformed and that he was blind from birth. But by what means um, he now sees, we do not know. Or who opened his eyes, we do not know. He is of age, ask him. He will speak of himself. You know, what was it behind all this that was causing him to respond, the, the parents to respond in this way? Because if it was me, and this was my son, and he had been blind from birth, I, I would be excited. I would want to, to stand with him in this and to believe him. Well, there's something that was keeping them from doing this. And in verse 22, thankfully, John, he, he helps us understand this. Um, he says in verse 22, his parents said these things because they feared the Jews. For the Jews had agreed already that if anyone confessed that he was Christ, he would be put out of the synagogue. And this was a serious thing. This was uh, really uh, something that um, was tough to come back from in this culture. Because religion and, and um, uh, what that meant for someone's social standing uh, was really important. Uh, we see that um, uh, fear, they feared getting involved because of the consequences this would bring. And they knew that uh, what was at stake in confessing Christ. It, what they were confessing was going to cause ostracism. It was going to cause um, them to lose their privileged status within the community. So this had major consequences um, for, for them, which is why that they were trying to, to be careful how they talked, and they were putting it back on their son. Let him speak. You know, this is uh, something that, that uh, he can talk. He's of age. So uh, the Pharisees, they didn't get anywhere. Uh, with, with asking the, the parents, other than finding out that this truly was the man. So uh, they called the man again, verse 24, and they called the man who was blind and said to him, give God the glory. We know that this man is a sinner. And, you know, it kind of reminded me of uh, these old, um, you know, detective movies, you know, that, you know, the guy with the cigar, and he's got the light on um, the person, and they're like, 
You know, they're trying to get the, the truth out of the person. And this is kind of what they're saying here. Give God the glory. You know, tell us what we want to hear. You know, that this man is a sinner. And I love the humble response of the blind, the, the man that was formerly blind. He answered and said, whether he's a sinner or not, I do not know. But one thing I know, that though I was blind, now I see. And we see this, um, just this witness to this is what is true. And it was humble. It was gracious. But we see even in this, uh, this statement, I believe the, the blind man's eyes opening to spiritual things. And uh, he knew one thing, that he had moved from physical darkness to physical light. And uh, <laughs> they said to him again, what did he do to you? How did he open your eyes in verse 26? And, you know, from this point on, it's really amazing to see the transformation happening in this blind man and the boldness he begins to speak with, the cunning. And, and look at the, the way that he answers um, here. It's like he's finally gotten to the point where he's tired of jumping around the issues and he's just going to go directly at the heart of the problem. Look what he says. He says, and he answered them, I told you already, and you did not listen. Why do you want to hear it again? Do you also want to become his disciples? <laughs> I, love, I love how he cuts through the problem, this problem of unbelief with this sarcasm, you know? And he goes to the heart of the issue, and intentions are revealed. A line is drawn in the sand between... Um, the disciples of Moses and the disciples of Jesus, and because this is what they bring up. Look at the, as we continue, they reviled him and said, you are his disciple, but we are Moses' disciples. Okay? We know that God spoke to Moses. As for this fellow, we don't know where he is from. So we see here really the problem, where the divide really is. And we see that they, they um, recognize themselves as disciples of Moses. And what's really behind this? What are, what, what, uh, what are they saying when they say that statement? And I think that a lot of it has to do with understanding what they were putting their hope in. One was the giver of the law. Moses, he was the giver of the law. But Jesus was the giver of grace. He was bringing grace. And this is what we see. We see that really they were putting their hope for salvation in the law instead of putting their hope in grace. Now, there's nothing, the, the, the law is not the problem, but putting your hope in the law for salvation is the problem. The, the, the law is actually to guide us to what is true, to recognize that we can't do this on our own, that we're incapable of being righteous ourselves. And this is the one thing that they had failed to recognize. They thought they were righteous. They thought they were good. But in reality, they were sinners as well. They were all sinners. So this is the problem that we see developing in the line, Jesus' disciples and Moses' disciples. So here we see uh, the, the blind man testify to Christ. And, and I just love how he testifies um, here as we look at verses 30 through 34. I'm going to read this, these verses. Read along with me. It says, The man answered and said to them, why, this is a marvelous thing that you do not know where he is from, yet he has opened my eyes. Now we know that God does not hear sinners, but if anyone is a worshiper of God and does his will, he hears him. Since the world began, it has been unheard of that anyone opened the eyes of one who was born blind. If this man were not from God, he could do nothing. And... You know, you, you have this, this blind man, you know, it's just amazing to me, someone that sat and begged, you know, his whole life. And then, you know, his eyes are open physically. And he, he starts to understand, okay, what's going on. He starts to, to, to be bolder and bolder um, to even identify himself as a disciple of Christ. And notice three, three ways that he speaks here. He speaks with cunning. And I love this first statement, why this is a marvelous thing. You know, it's like, well, I'm flabbergasted. Like, I'm standing here, and I'm looking at you. Hello, duh. Like, come on, guys. 
you know, isn't this proof enough, you know, that, uh, that he has done something amazing? Um, and then we, we see the authority he speaks with. Look at verse 31. He says, now we know that God, God does not hear sinners, but if anyone's a worshiper of, God, worshiper of God and does his will, he hears him. We see him like switching the table, like the, these Pharisees thought that they had the authority. And all of a sudden, this blind man is standing there testifying, and he's turning it on his head. He's saying, this is what we know to be true. And finally, he, he, look at the fulfillment that he speaks with. Since the world began, it was unheard of that anyone opened the eyes of one born blind. And what we see is Jesus being the only one to that point in the history of the world that had opened the, the eyes of a blind man. We see uh, him bringing forth the fulfillment of Isaiah 35. And this blind man's reminding the, uh, the, ther- the Pharisees of what has come in the fulfillment of Christ. So we see this cunning, this authority, this fulfillment. And at this point, the Pharisees, are, they don't know what to do, you know. It, it, look, at, look at their answer. <laughs> they answered and said to him, you were completely born in sins and you were teaching us, and they cast him out. It's kind of like the kid that says, all right, well, I'm taking my ball and going home. You know, at this point, they've lost the, the debate. They, they have nothing left to say because he had spoke with such authority and with such power that at this point, they say, okay, well, you, you can just get out of here. And we see them cast him out. You know, uh, for me, this is the lowest point for this man in the story. You know, we, we see this blind man um, who had been in this place and he had suffered uh, for so many years. And just when he receives his sight back, you know, you think about all the community that he was left out of, all the things he was excluded from, from his life. Um, you know, he was considered a sinner. He wasn't part of the community. He had been excluded from these things. And finally, he gets his sight back. Finally, he has the opportunity to step back in to the community, the people of God. And what happens? They cast him right back out again. They exclude him. And this is where Jesus meets you. This is the place where Jesus finds you. Jesus heard that they had cast him out. And when they had found him, when he had found him, he said to him, Do you believe in the Son of God? And he answered and said, Who is he, Lord, that I might believe in him? And Jesus said to him, You have both seen him, and it is he who is talking with you. Then he said, Lord, I believe. And he worshipped him. It's a beautiful picture of how spiritual eyes are opened. Going from seeing things in a physical way to encountering Christ and being open, to your mind open to spiritual things. We got from this physical transformation to this spiritual transformation. And notice the, the faith that he needed for both, for the physical transformation and the spiritual transformation. You know, he had to take those steps of faith down to the pool of Siloam in order to be healed. He had to take the step of faith to encounter the, the, the Christ, to recognize who he was and to believe. So we see how faith precedes belief. And this is something we've been talking about through John. That, that as we, we understand and we re- realize that faith is a gift, then we are able to, um, to understand how we, we believe on the Son of Man, how we believe on the Son of God. Faith precedes belief. And faith uh, is what led him to believe and the one that could make him righteous, the one that could take away his sin. And uh, notice the progression through this whole account. We look at uh, verse 11, and we see this man uh, call, he says, from the man they call Jesus. So he recognizes his name, Jesus, in verse 11. Then in verse 17, he moves on to say that he's a prophet, in verse 17. Then in verse 30, he uh, makes this statement that he opened my eyes. Verse 33, that he is from God. And then now, finally, to Lord I believe, and he worshiped him in verse 38. And we see how, how um, he is moving 
from one place to another place and seeing with spiritual eyes. And notice what follows his belief. Worship. He, you know, this idea of worship means to prostrate yourself before, to, to submit yourself uh, in obedience to someone. And this is the idea we see here, that as he believed, he moved into worshiping Jesus. And the heart of those who believe is to bring him worship. So we see this account. And then right here at the end, we have these last um, three verses. And I think they're important to our, our text because they say, uh, you know, Jesus makes this, this statement. He says, he said, for judgment ha- I have come into this world that those who do not see may see, and those who see may be made blind. Then some of the Pharisees who were with him heard these words and said to him, Are we blind also? And Jesus said to them, If you were blind, you would have no sin. But now you say, We see, therefore your sin remains. And we see this picture of the light of the world here. And, uh, you know, we, we have this topic of judgment that comes up. And, you know, we know earlier in John, it almost seems like a contradiction, right? That he would say he doesn't come into the world for judgment. Um, and then here he says, uh, you know, for judgment um, I have come. But what we have to understand is that the presence of the Son of God is going to cause someone to either walk into the shadow of judgment or are going to cause someone to walk into the light, to be brought into the light. Spiritual sight depends on what you believe as you encounter the Christ. Today you might believe that he's just a a good man. You might believe that he's just another prophet. Or you'll believe that he's the one capable of healing your wounds. of, uh, Of making you righteous before God. Of bringing you into fellowship with God. And Jesus is the only one who really can make sense of our suffering. And last week we talked about that there at the end of our, in our discussion, you know, what suffering was for. I believe that we're created for a purpose regardless of our circumstances, the things that we're born into, and we're made to display the works of God. And it's right there in our text. If you look back to verse 3, John says, well, Jesus answered, he said this, neither this man nor his parents sinned, but that the works of God should be revealed in him, that he would display the works of God. And suffering, it really only begins to make sense when we begin to see with spiritual eyes why we were created, to be signposts that declare the glory of God. And you know, as a sign, it's going to point the way to something that's exactly what we're to be. We're, we're to be um, signs that display the glory of God. They point to the glory of God, the Creator. Just like all creation declares the glory of God. So by the power of the Spirit, we are to be lights in the world that declare the glory of God.